Hi, good evening. My name's Caroline. I'm John. And I'm Graham. And welcome to our service this evening here at St John's Hoxton. Well, I say at St John's Hoxton from various locations, um, but the Church of the People, isn't it, rather than the building. You are very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Whether you are a regular evening member, or regular member of the evening congregation, that's the order I want those words in, or whether it's your first time here with us, really warm welcome to you. One of the things we love uh, for you to be able to do is to engage with us as we go through our service. So do feel free to drop comments or prayer requests or emojis into the comments box on Facebook and we will do our best to respond. There are members of the team waiting to respond to uh, prayer requests or any questions that you might have. So do feel free to do that. John, what's going on in the service today? Tonight we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to worship Jesus together. We love spending time in worship together. And then we're going to head over to our discipleship corner where we have an interview with um, a member of our congregation or a special guest uh, where we ask really practical questions, how we can disciple, how we can apprentice under Jesus better. Uh, and that's going to be great. And then we're going to have a talk from Stephen. Um, so let's head on in. Let's worship together. Graham, how about you pray for us as we start? That'd be great. I'd love to. I want to invite you just where you are now, uh, whether you're in your living room, your bedroom, your kitchen, whoever you're with, just um, take a moment, close your eyes. You might want to open your hands outstretched in front of you. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and be with you wherever you are, whoever you're with. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, come now and fill every heart and every home. Be with us as we worship Jesus tonight. Lift our eyes to see Jesus afresh. Open our hearts to receive the Father's love for us and help us to worship you. Help us to be transformed. Lord Jesus, come and be with us wherever we are. Right now we ask. We ask this all in your name. Amen.
have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave you freed every captive and break every chain oh god you have to
surrounding me let it break at your name still you call the seed is still the rage you need is still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble these bones to live you call these lungs to sing once again
Father, we thank you that you have been with us in this time as we've sung uh, songs of praise to you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you've been working among us. Whether we feel it or not, we thank you that you have been with us, that you have been working in our hearts. Lord, we pray that we will continue to be listening to you, that we will continue to be open to your presence. We continue to offer our thanks and praise as we go through the rest of the service. Oh Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for your saving love of us. Amen. Amen. Welcome once again. If you've joined us since the beginning of the service, it's really great to have you with us. We would love to know who you are, where you're from, where you're watching. So do stick a comment in the thread, throw up an emoji, and interact, engage with us if you are able to. It'd be really lovely to uh, see you tonight. And we are also here, the team are here online at the moment. And so if you have a prayer request, you can send it as a direct message to the page, or you can uh, ask for prayer in, in the comment box. And we'd love to be praying for you this evening. We also really want to help you to get connected in the life of the church. And if you're new to St. John's, I want to invite you to head over to our website and our welcome page where you can fill in a sort of digital connect card. And that will enable us to get in touch with you, uh, keep you connected with what's going on in the life of the church. So you can head to the website link. uh, The link will be on the screen just now uh, to fill in a digital connect card. And if you are in the church, but you're struggling to get a bit more engaged and involved, then we want to invite you to join a connect group. Connect groups are just groups of six, seven, eight people or so who meet during the week uh, for Bible study, for prayer, for conversation, for friendship. Um, And they're all meeting online at the moment at different times, uh, different days. So there'll be something for everyone. And again, the link is on the screen now. So you can head on over and find out what's on offer and how to join. Uh, Final bit of family news from me. Uh, As many of you know, we're involved in this uh, project around uh, community organizing. And one of the things we're doing is we're we're thinking about how as a church we respond in our neighborhood in Hoxton to local need uh, and particularly the local need that might be arising out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've put together a super short survey. Uh, It's only got three questions. It should take you no more than three, four minutes or so to fill out. And it would be wonderful if you would take a few minutes just to let us know what's affecting you what's affecting the people around you uh, so that we can tailor our response and try and meet people at their point of need so we're going to put in the comments thread just now the link for that survey so that you can find it you can click it you might have received it in an email or a text message as well but please uh, please tell us what you think we should be doing John. Great. What we're going to do next is we're going to head into our discipleship corner. Uh, and in that, we're going to ask some really practical questions to a member of our congregation or a special guest. Uh, this week, it's Laurie. We're going to chat with Laurie, who's a member of our congregation, has been for uh, a few years now, and she's great. And I can't wait for you to hear what she has to say. But we're going to just really dig into what it is to follow Jesus in the, in, in the current climate of lockdown and the coronavirus. So let's head on it. Welcome to the Discipleship Corner. I'm here with Laurie uh, and the Discipleship Corner is all about helping us learn how to be better disciples and apprentices under Jesus. Uh, And I'm here with Laurie this week. It's great to have you, Laurie. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, And I've just got a few questions, a few things that we want to ask you. All right, so we'll we'll get started. And for those that don't know you and watching now, how about you tell us a bit about yourself your journey with Jesus and your journey with church. So I actually grew up in church. My parents ran my local church for the first 14 years. So I was like right in the center of where it was happening. Um, And I think the thing that drew me towards um, kind of like seeking a relationship with Jesus the most was the fact that I could see really clearly um, how God moved in my parents' life. I was surrounded by stories of like God providing financially and emotionally and supporting people in like really significant situations. Um, And I think like I just have always had the the desire to seek that out for myself and to like build my own really authentic faith. I think also because I'm just quite stubborn um, and I don't want to believe stuff just because my parents do. So I'm like, this will be my own say. 
um yeah um so we're three weeks in to lockdown uh three weeks in three months in i wish we were three weeks in three months into <laughs> lockdown how are you doing how, how's it going where, where are you at the moment i mean i would like to say it's easier now it's been going on longer but i think it's just like slowly starting to suffocate everyone um i think it's interesting because there are, I've moved from living in a flat in London to living with my parents and my brother. Um, and there's a few things that are a lot easier because mom's cooking all my meals. Nice. Um, I didn't mention that I am chronically ill. <laughs> my mum was diagnosed with MS when I was 16, which causes fatigue. And the whole experience was really traumatic. Um, it was like really confusing and, um, kind of disruptive time and I started to get migraines um, and over the years I've just got progressively more ill with chronic fatigue, chronic pain and a lot of different mental health problems um, and it's kind of at the point where I'm not able to look after myself um, I'm not being an independent adult so. No. Laurie there's quite clearly a lot going on uh, in, in, at home in, in your personal life how do you find Jesus in all of that? How, how do you do relationship with him in the midst of that? That is something that I have been asking myself um, because it's really difficult when you have really difficult um, mental health problems that is make you feel um, distant from everyone. Naturally, you're also going to struggle with your relationship. Um, and also being exhausted all the time and having a really short um, attention span, I guess. It's really difficult to engage with things like quiet time or prayer because I just get confused. I forget what I was saying. I'm really tired. Um, so I've had to like kind of reimagine how to do that. Um, I think the biggest thing actually has been being gracious to myself in that and knowing that like our relationship with Jesus isn't something that we have to kind of earn um and there are you know worship is bigger than just one-on-one -on -one time i think surviving has been so difficult to me everything i do to try and make that easier um is kind of an expression of trust that i've got a hope in a future um and trying to kind of tell myself that it's okay if that's all i can do to for Jesus. And um, what, what advice would you give to someone listening who, who thinks, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really struggling with mental health, I'm really struggling to connect with Jesus in lockdown. What, what advice would you give to that person? Um, I think sometimes we can have like an image in our head of what connecting to Jesus has to look like and that can feel really impossible. Um, I think just taking like figuring out what the next step is that's actually doable for you and consistently doing that and knowing that 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 counts like Jesus Jesus gets what's happening like he experienced so many difficult emotions um also I think um there's this moment um in Elijah's life that I always try and remind myself of when he just had this huge spiritual event. Um, there's the story of the fire on Mount Carmel. Um, and afterwards, he's gone from this huge high to basically being like, God, I don't want to be alive anymore. Um, and God doesn't say, oh, Elijah, well, why don't you just open the Bible and seek me out and read the scriptures and spend loads of time in prayer? What he says is, eat some food and have a sleep. Um, and often, like, looking after yourself is the most important thing you can do. And Laurie, my final question, uh, and we were laughing about this before as we chatted about it, um, bit of a weird question, but uh, if we could learn from your mistakes in your life, that could be towards your mental health, towards your relationship with Jesus, uh, anything, um, what advice would you give us? Um, I think the thing that I've been learning the most recently um, is that it's really not a good idea to run away from how you feel. I know people say that a lot, but it's like really, really not a good idea. Um, 
I, I actually have a condition where one of the symptoms is trying to escape from your feelings and not face up to them. And I didn't realize how much damage that had done to my relationship with myself and the people around me. Um, it's always better to communicate, whether that is saying to someone, um, oh, I've really been struggling with the way that you spoke to me the other week because uh, I kind of thought you meant that. And it had been this huge event in my head. And then you talk to someone and they're like, oh, no, it was fine. I didn't think that at all. Um, it just clears it up. But also communicating how you feel. I think it's really easy to think, oh, but if I think about the anxiety or I think about the hopelessness, um, I don't, I don't want to sit with those feelings because they're difficult. But the only way to have freedom from them or for them to resolve is just to dive in and I think you have to like slowly build up your um, tolerance for it but find ways that make you feel safe doing that um a lot of the time I found just like talking to God about it has been really helpful um, and I think actually that's what people talk about when they talk about God being your refuge um great Thanks so much, Laura. It's great to hear um, about your journey with mental health, your journey in, in lockdown and your journey in discipleship with Jesus and apprenticeship with Jesus. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. It's been really great to have you. Uh, and I hope you guys at home found that really helpful. Um, if you have any questions, do pop us a message. Uh, send a message to the St. John's Hoxton page or visit the website. There's loads of contact details there. Thanks so much for that, Laurie. If anyone's got any questions or comments that they would uh, like to send Laurie's way, the easiest way is going to be just to directly message the St John's Hoxton Facebook page and then we can pass them on, uh, make sure she gets them and work out how we can feedback answers to you on that. But I'm sure there was lots in there to think about. Stephen's going to give us a talk now and John is going to pray for him. Great. Let's pray as Stephen begins to speak. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would fill us now, uh, that you would help us to receive um, every bit of what Stephen has to say. And I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, help it to sink really deep into our hearts, help us to have ears to hear um, what he has to say, and just bless him now as he speaks to us. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen, and I'm part of the team here at St John's. So today we're continuing with our series called Rebuilders, Life After Lockdown. And we're looking through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're trying to wrap our heads around the future and think about what we want our lives and the world to be uh, after lockdown, after COVID-19. What's that going to look like? What do we want it to look like? So the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were actually originally one text. And they tell the story of three great rebuilders, Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah. And each of those guys, they have uh, a role to play. They help in the rebuilding of God's temple and bringing back his law and in ultimately uh, building back up Jerusalem and Israel after the Babylonian uh, exile. They're in charge of bringing God's people back into the promised land. And the story of each of those rebuilders is a bit like this bungee cord. Have you seen uh, videos of athletes who are training by running against a bungee cord? What they do is they attach one end to something solid, like a wall or a post, and then they run as fast as they can. And they're trying to fight against the pull of that cord. And they run through the slack and they sprint and they try and they strain. But eventually the cord reaches the point where its elasticity just pulls them back down. And at the start of each of these three men's uh, journeys, Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah, there's this sort of exhilarating rush back into the land of God, back to the place where God's people were meant to be. And then there's this full speed rush and then the reality of the situation hits and they each have to deal with this problem caused by the world around them. And our passage today is part of the story of the second of those great rebuilders, Ezra. 
And it's how he responds to that moment of tension, of being pulled back to reality. And it's when his full-on sprint into the promised land meets the mess and the complexities of people's lives. So we're going to look at Ezra chapter 9 verses 6 to 15. Uh, but first I'm going to go through a bit of context. So Ezra was a scholar. He's an expert in the Old Testament law. Actually, he was charged with rejuvenating the worshipping life of the Israelites, bringing it back in line with the law. He was going to restore their identity as this holy people by bringing them to the Torah. So he leads a group of Israelites from Babylon to Jerusalem to join the others who have already arrived. And when Ezra gets there, he is told by the leaders of the people that some of those who had already returned have married into the communities around them. And this is something that is explicitly forbidden by Moses. And Ezra is appalled by this. He is furious. In chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, he says, When I heard this, I tore my cloak and my tunic. I pulled the hair from my head and beard, and I sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the Lord, of the God of Israel, gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. It seems like a massive overreaction, right? So why does it matter who these people have married? Ezra doesn't even know them yet. He's barely arrived. They arrived 60 years before he did, with the last lot that Zerubbabel left. And I think that there, there's something really crucial to remember here, is that marriage in Ezra's time was sort of very differently to how we think about it now. I mean, so it was still between two people, two individuals who commit to each other. But who you were married to uh, had this sort of immense amount of influence on a person. It tied you into their family group, into their kin, into their tribe, their culture, their religion. So when an Israelite man marries a non-Israelite woman, it's a way of sort of pulling him and his family out of the sacred people of God, out, out of being set apart by God. As far as Ezra was concerned, the Israelites had committed this massive sin. And the passage we're going to look at is his prayer of penitence for his people. So Ezra, he tears his cloak, he tears his hair out, he gathers his faithful around him, and then he goes to the temple, he falls to his knees, he spreads his arm, and now we're going to turn to Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. And he prays, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you. My God, because our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity to pillage and humiliation, at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious and leaving us a remnant, and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes, and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. He has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, O oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted, by the corruption of its people, by their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong 
and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great relief. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the people who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt. Though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. Amen. It's quite a hard passage. It's raw, it's really open, isn't it? I think that we can see something that's really important about how we can start to think about rebuilding our lives, how we can look and think about rebuilding the society around us after lockdown. Because we can see that we have to start not with a bang, but with a whimper. The thing is that Ezra is a scholar. He knows the law, he knows the history of his people, and he grew up during the exile. That's a time when God had removed the Israelites, they had, he had removed them from his promised land and sent them away, sent them into bondage, into slavery. It's a time to punish them, to, to make them reflect upon what had gone wrong. It's a time of sort of forced time out, I guess. And Ezra, he knows this. He has no illusions about his people. He knows that they've messed up and he's honest and he's open with God. He says in verse 7, From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. So he doesn't lie. He doesn't try to make things sound better. He just accepts it. He knows his people have messed up. And that is crucial. Ezra is trying to rebuild the life of his people, to rebuild his nation, to rebuild his culture, to rebuild his faith, to bring his people back to where they are meant to be, deep relationship with God. And he starts by admitting what's gone wrong. He starts the rebuilding, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Not by declaring their greatness, by talking about their great kings and their victories but by admitting their brokenness. And when we look at our society and our lives during and after lockdown, when we think about how we can rebuild them, I think that this is where we have to start too. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. I'm sure you've seen the footage of protesters out on the streets just asserting their right to be alive, to not have their oppressors glorified. And I'm sure you've seen how they've been met by really vicious right-wing thuggery. I'm sure you've seen on the news some of the terrible things about mental health and loneliness and isolation during lockdown. Or how COVID-19 is affecting a BAME population worse than others. Or about child hunger over the summer holidays or the increasing environmental disaster. I'm sure you've seen that the world around us needs rebuilding needs to be brought back into relationship with God. And like Ezra, we have to start that rebuilding by admitting that there is a problem to be solved. Yes, we have to educate ourselves about the struggles of those around us. Just like Ezra. Ezra was a scholar, he was a historian, he understood. But mostly and crucially, we have to admit that things have gone wrong. We have to drop this pretense that things are fine. It's all very, that's all very well on a sort of big cultural scale, right? I know that sometimes I read the news or I'm watching TV and things just seem like such a massive problem and there's nothing I can really do. Maybe go on a protest, but like, this is lockdown, what do we do? It's so complicated. Well, there, there are actually loads of things that we can't do. It's part of the core aims of St. John's, to transform Hoxton, to transform society. 
And in a moment, I'll be dropping a little link into the comments box. Uh, it's going to take you to some of the great stuff that can happen. Some of how uh, community organising has helped St John's to take individual people like you and me and bring them up to that systemic level so that we can start to deal with problems. But that's, that's not the end of the story. It doesn't just stay at that abstract level. It also is true for our lives. We have to admit that there's a problem. I know that it's definitely been true for me. See, for many years, I turned my back on God's love. I did that classic thing when I was a young, younger man, uh, and I went my own way. Said I wanted to live my own life. Do the things that young men want to do. I say young. I'm 26. I'm still pretty young. I was like 18. Uh, and to be honest, like the Israelites, I messed up horribly. It was only when I could actually admit how bad things had gone, how much hurt I had caused other people, how much hurt I had frankly caused myself. It was only at that point, in that ruin, that there was room and space for God to move, for God to move in my life again. And that's the next step that Ezra identifies. That from this point of understanding how broken we as individuals and as a society are, that God's redemptive action can move. It's as if by clearing the space in that, that rubble, God's arm can reach out. Ezra sees it and he praises God for it. He sees that despite the fact his people have messed up again and again, and again, God is still moving through them. That he is still for them. From verse 9, he says that he has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and to repair its ruins. What a hope is that? We know that when we look at the mess and the hurt of our society, when we look at our lives and the pain there, we know that that is where God is moving. That he is moving through it. We know this because that is what he has done for his people before. That is what he did for Ezra. That is what he did for countless others. So Ezra, he sees this wonderful, this powerful, this timeless truth of how God is moving through the ruins. He's moving through the ruins of his people to redeem them once again, to bring them back to him. We know that that is what he is doing for us, for you, for me, for our society. Do you remember where we started with that image of an athlete running against a bungee cord to train? Of how when they pull at that greatest extent, that is when things start to get messy and start to be pulled back. But actually, that first mad dash is all very well. But it's only when the bungee cord starts to, starts to pull against them that the athlete gets stronger. And it's like that with our relationship with God too. It's at the times when we feel that things are getting harder, that God is actually making us stronger. I know that for me, it's times in my life when, frankly, things have been the worst, when they've been the most painful, the most messed up. Those have been the points when God has made my faith strongest, when he has come down and met me in that place. And he does that for each and every one of us. And I want to end by going through verse 9 again. And I'm going to, and then I'm going to give us a moment. It's going to be a bit awkward, you'll probably just see me on the screen just sort of standing with my eyes closed for a couple of minutes. But what I'm going to do is give us a moment to reflect, to think upon what God is doing in our lives, how he is meeting us in that mess. It might actually be a time for you to admit that things have gone wrong. It's not social media. You can admit that things are a bit sucky right now. You can admit that the world isn't the way you want it to be, that your life isn't the way you want it to be. So I'm going to read verse 9, and then we're going to have a moment to reflect, and then I'll end us in prayer. Ezra chapter 9 verse 9. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. 
he has granted us new life, to rebuild the house of our God and to repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. Amen. Let's just take a moment. Take a moment to hear God, to open up our hearts and our minds and our lives to him. It's hard to do this in a sort of pre-recorded, weird online way, but I think that God is moving in some of our lives right now. I think that God is moving in our hearts. That is a great and wonderful thing. And we as a church seek that and we want to pray for people who feel that. So please let us know. Pop a comment in the box. Say, God gave me this picture, this image, this idea, this verse. Let us know. We're there. We're here for you. It's literally what gives us the most joy imaginable. So if that's you, pop a comment in the box. Let us know. We'd love to pray for you. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done. For your immense love, for your compassion, your kindness. Lord, we thank you that you meet us in the ruins of our lives. It is when we are hurting and lost that you call us. Lord, we thank you that you call each of your children by name to bring us home to you. Thank you. Father, please give us that patience. Please give us wisdom. Wisdom to see how you are moving. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. Amen. I uh, know. Uh, Again, this is weird. I've never done this uh, pre-recorded and online before. But while we were praying just then, I sort of, I think I might have got a a picture for someone. Um, It might be someone who's watching live now, or it might be someone who's going to watch in a month, I'd say. Seems unlikely, but it might be. Um, It's a picture of a sheep. It's one of the things that I find really incredibly comforting. In uh, the Gospels, Jesus describes himself as a shepherd. He knows his sheep by name. He has immense affection for them. This is actually an image that uh, I've had applied to me in the past, but just someone needs to hear that the hand of God is reaching down onto your head. And just like a sheep, his hand is twining in your hair. And he's saying he is there. You might be lost now, but he's still with you that was an image for you or you have an image of your own let us know it'll literally make our day on that walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall but you have never felt me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never felt me yet i
still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never
I never will forget That you've never felt me yet And I never will forget Thank you for worshipping with us today. I really hope you have enjoyed the service. I want to say just a couple of words about what it means to belong to St John's Hoxton. I have a little saying, anyone can attend, but belonging is coming at cost. Now the good news is you have already attended. You chose to join with us for worship today. And for that, we're really grateful. It wouldn't be the same without you. But if you want to belong and go deeper and get engaged more with the church, I think there are three things you need to do. Number one, you need to join a connect group. That's where we form friendship, connect with one another, do life together, support one another. Number two, I want to encourage you to find a way to serve on a team, a mission or ministry team in the church. And if it's not something directly related to the church, find a way that you can serve in your neighbourhood to bring the kingdom of God wherever you are. And number three, I want to invite you to give and to invest financially in the life, the mission and the ministry of the church. What does it mean to give and to invest in the mission and ministry of the church? Well, everything that we do is funded from your generosity. We are able to raise some money, usually through uh, premises lettings and other income that we raise from the building. But in this season, almost all of that income has disappeared. We are projecting a drop in income of around 80 to 100,000 pounds due to lost premises bookings and uh, a drop in car parking use here at the church. We're so thankful for your generosity that enables us to keep on going with youth ministry, children's ministry, outreach to students and young adults, serving the poor, getting involved in community organising, helping to support uh, debt counselling and uh, all the other things that go on here. We couldn't do what we do if it weren't for your cheerful, generous, sacrificial giving. And so I want to encourage you, uh, if you've never set up regular giving, standing order giving, uh, to support the mission of the church, now is the time to do so. It's a Christian principle that we give generously because God has given generously to us. It's a Christian principle that when we give away sacrificially, we have confidence and trust that God will provide for all of our needs. And it's a Christian principle that when we give, we give cheerfully, joyfully, hilariously, because it reflects the love of God for the world. So make your tithe, make your offering, use the links on the screen now to get connected, to invest and to give generously to the mission and ministry of the church. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, guys. It's been really great to worship together, uh, to learn and grow together about how to apprentice, how to disciple under Jesus together. Um, it would be great to interact with you uh, in the week. We have connect groups. We've got morning prayer happening every day, every weekday at 9 a.m. Uh, and also, I'd really encourage you, if you have any uh, questions, any prayer requests, do message the, the Facebook page. Do get in contact. Head over to the website. There's loads of contact details there. If you need anything, if you're struggling, do reach out. We would love to support you, pray for you, and stand by in this time. Uh, also, hang out together. And join a connect group. Call one another. Let's support each other during this really hard time of lockdown. Caroline, could you pray for us as we go? Oh, my pleasure. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we've had this time to worship together, that even though we might be geographically distant by your spirit, we are united. We are one body, your bride. Lord, we thank you that you have been with us. Thank you for all that you have been teaching us. And Lord, we pray that as we go into the rest of our weeks, what you have been speaking to us, teaching us today would sink deep 
that we wouldn't just forget it, but that we would dwell on it. We would let your word dwell in our hearts. That it would make us more like Jesus, your son, every day. A little bit by a little bit, we would become more like Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we go, that you would bless our families and those that we love. May we know your presence with us. And may we have your saving love, your joy, your peace in our hearts always. Amen. 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 Thanks so much for joining us. It's been wonderful to worship with you and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.